This meeting is being recorded. The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. And without objection, members of the full committee, not on this subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. Members are reminded to keep their video function on at all times even when they are not recognized by the chair. Members are also reminded that they are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves and to mute themselves after they are finished speaking. Consistent with the regulations accompanying HR uh, 965, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate and not recognized to avoid inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that all house rules relating to order and decorum apply to this remote hearing. This hearing is entitled Promoting Inclusive Lending During the Pandemic, Community Development Financial <laughs> Institutions and Minority Depository Institutions. This is the Financial Services Committee's first ever virtual hearing. So let's all be patient with one another and with ourselves and be kind to our witnesses who have graciously accepted to join us in testing the new phase of committee work. And again, please, everyone remember to put yourselves on mute when you are not speaking. I will now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. I want to thank Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for, and my colleague, Mr. Luca Meyer, who is the ranking member of this subcommittee, and all of my other colleagues for your participation in today's hearing entitled Promoting Inclusive Lending During the Pandemic community development financial institutions, and minority depository institutions. We are living in unprecedented times, and our nation's unemployment rate is the highest since the Great Depression. 40 million Americans have lost their jobs since the start of COVID-19 pandemic. Over 100,000 Americans have died, and many more are expected to die before the pandemic is over. In Queens, New York, where my district lies, they, uh, they have lost more people than most states in the union. And now, compounding our nation's suffering and turmoil, the persistence of violence and brutality against black men and women across this nation has sparked a nationwide movement for desperately needed reforms. We are a great nation. And I continue to believe in the potential and the promise of America. And I gotta say that the last few months have amplified what we have all been observing for years. Many places of worship have taken to saying that we are all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. While some can shelter in place and work seamlessly from home and have their every need and convenience delivered to their doorstep from the convenience of an app, millions more have lost their jobs or forced to literally risk their lives to perform tasks such as delivering the mail, keeping essential stores and services open, and of course, ensuring the continued availability of healthcare. While the connected few, big companies, universities with massive endowments, and even professional sports teams all inappropriately assessed millions of dollars from the PPP program, the small employers, the family businesses, and local nonprofits for which Congress established a program were forced to shut their doors and furloughed millions of their employees. While COVID-19 does not discriminate, it has laid bare the structural inequalities in our healthcare, education, banking, transportation, and yes, our system of police and justice. The Black and Hispanic communities have borne a disproportionate burden in this pandemic as have Native American communities, which we don't talk about enough. Congress moved quickly to establish and fund programs to help middle-class and low-income families, which were already struggling to make ends meet what was supposedly 
a prospering economy. Congress moved expeditiously to structure and fund programs to keep homeowners and renters in their homes and avert the next housing crisis. We passed record funding to support small businesses and entrepreneurs who form the backbone of our nation's employment engine. But we need accountability on the implementation of these programs and confirmation that Congress's intent to reach the most vulnerable and most those most at risk has been followed. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their participation here today, for their work in serving the underbanked and vulnerable communities. And I look forward to a robust discussion about how we can leverage our banking laws and community development financial institutions to achieve a balanced and equitable recovery from these dark days. I now yield to the ranking member, member Mr. Lukabaya, for four <clears throat> minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, and thank you to all of the witnesses for joining us today. Today's hearing focuses on promoting inclusion in lending, particularly with respect to minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions. As we know, MDIs and CDFIs make up a significant portion of the banking services for minority-owned businesses and majority-minority neighborhoods. <clears throat> in light of the events over the last few weeks, it's important that we conduct this hearing with the understanding that every member of this subcommittee agrees that there is no place for racism in banking, and more importantly, in our society. We've, seen all the, we've all seen the horrific video of the death of George Floyd. There's not a person present at this hearing who isn't disgusted by the actions of that police officer and the officers at the site who did nothing to stop it. I can't imagine the pain his family is feeling and hope they will be able to find some peace and justice that must and will be served. While banking policy can seem menial at a time when the country is recovering from a once in a century pandemic and as protests continue around the country, the services our witnesses and financial institutions across the U.S. provide are fundamental to rebuilding our economy. Unfortunately, the damage left in the wake of the looting and rioting by people who have hijacked peaceful protests will also require significant investment and work from, from financial institutions on top of what was already a monumental task. As all of you remember, Congress and the administration took decisive action to pass the CARES Act in the wake of, of the economic shutdown due to the novel coronavirus. This legislation included many provisions designed to provide relief and forbearance to American families and businesses. Most notably, it established the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. <clears throat> At first, Congress appropriated $350 billion for the PPP. Not only did Treasury have to set up this program within two weeks, but the program sent out more funding in 14 days than the SBA had done in 14 years. The success of the first round led the Congress to appropriate an additional $310 billion for PPP. However, to ensure small institutions <clears throat> excuse me, were the drivers of this program, Congress set aside $30 billion for financial institutions with below $10 billion in assets and another $30 billion for those with between $10 and $50 billion in assets. The latest PPP numbers on May 30th show the average PPP loan is $114,000 and roughly 80% of loans made are below $100,000. Furthermore, the number one industry receiving PPE funding is a critical healthcare and social assistance sector. MDIs and CDFIs have played a vital role in this program, as well by making a combined $15.8 billion in loans. To put that into perspective, that is more money than 42 states received under this program. What is most notable about these statistics is that 170 minority deposit institutions made 107,000 loans totaling more than $10 billion. That averages out to 300, or six, excuse me, 630 loans per minority deposit institution, averaging $95,000 per loan. While these numbers express the success of the PPP program, there is no government program that goes, without, goes off without a hitch. Since the passage of the CARES Act, I have conversations with the bankers across the country from Washington State to Florida, and heard many concerns with, from financial institutions, particularly smaller community institutions, we're having with the program. I know there were many concerns with SBA's ETRAN portal, loan documentation, and forgiveness documentation, just to name a few. With the demand for PPP program uh, loans slowing down and the Congress looking to take action, amending the program to extend the covered period and alter forgiveness par parameters, we should take this opportunity to examine what issues have plagued the institutions of all types, and specifically MDIs and CDFIs. I thank all of you for being here today and look forward to hearing your testimony. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, 
<clears throat> so I now will yield. Well, let's go to the witnesses. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce. Um, Is the chairwoman there? Chairwoman Waters. I, I yield one minute to the chairwoman of the subcommittee of the full committee. If not, I will yield one minute to the ranking yeah. member of the subcommittee, Mr. McHenry. Um, well, opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Meeks, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Luca Meyer. Uh, I welcome the uh, witnesses discussion today. I think we all have an interest in ensuring uh, that uh, uh, the broad base of, of our populace in our country, uh, whether rural or, or urban, uh, whether uh, living on the margins or uh, those that have ne newly found themselves living on the margins, that they have equal access uh, to financial products and especially the, the ones we urgently put in place uh, in a bipartisan way through the CARES Act. So I welcome the discussion today. Uh, it's a very important and topical one, uh, given uh, the state of what is happening across America today. Uh, finally, on a personal note, uh, I think we're all deeply affected by what, uh, what occurred in Minneapolis and now what is occurring across the country. Uh, there is uh, something sickening and awful about um, what we witnessed uh, happen uh, to Mr. Floyd. And so this should not occur. And um, uh, we are better than that as a populace and a people, and we should uh, respond together. So with that, thank you and look forward to the witnesses testimony. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, now let me introduce the witnesses. Uh, first, Ms. Lisa Mensa. President and Chief Executive Officer of the Opportunity Finance Network. Under her leadership, OFN helped CDFIs leverage public funding with private investment from mainstream financial institutions, socially responsible investors, and philanthropic partners in distressed communities across America. In 2014, Ms. Mensa was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate for the position of Under Secretary of Agriculture for rural development. In this role, she managed a loan portfolio of $215 billion, directing annual investments of $30 billion in critical infrastructure for rural America. Ms. Mensa developed new partnerships with private and philanthropic partners to generate $120 million in private grants and loan guarantees for the persistently poor rural communities. Before her appointment as Undersecretary, she was the founding executive director of the Initiative on Financial Security at the Aspen Institute, where she led a national bipartisan effort with leaders of financial institutions, nonprofit executives, and experts to promote savings, home ownership, and retirement policies and products. She began her career in commercial banking at Citibank before joining the Ford Foundation, where she was responsible for the country's largest philanthropic grant loan portfolio of investments in rural America. Next, we'll have Mr. Michael T. Pugh, President and Chief Executive Officer and Board Member of the Carver Federal Savings Bank. A banking veteran of more than 22 years, Mr. Pugh has led teams of up to 600 associates in retail business banking, commercial and resident lending, and call center operations. He has led bank technology integrations, launching new lines of business and, ex and executing new growth market strategies. Prior to joining Carver in August of 2012, Mr. Pugh worked at the Capital One uh, as a senior vice president, a regional executive and market president of the Eastern Maryland, Delaware and Washington DC markets, where he was responsible for revenue production customer service and bank operations for approximately 75 banking centers and $3 billion in deposits. In addition, he led the bank's community development strategy for 1,200 associates in eight counties. Mr. Pugh is a board member for several not-for-profit organizations, including the Community Development Bankers Association and the Society for Financial Education and Professional Development, where he serves as its chairman. Our next witness 
is Mr. Samuel C. Scott, Chairman, Black Chicago Tomorrow, and Co-Chair of American Business Immigration Coalition. Mr. Scott founded Chicago, founded Black Chicago Tomorrow to pull together the resources of the public and private sector to address the needs of vulnerable and minority communities of Chicago and help set them on a path to a brighter future. Mr. Scott also serves on the board of the American Business Immigration Coalition, which provides a strong and effective voice for American businesses and the national immigration conversation and advocates for sound, coherent immigration reform and the integration of immigrants into our economy as consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, and citizens. Mr. Scott is the retired chairman, president, and chief executive officer of Corn Products International, today known as Indragun. He also serves on the board of the Bank of New York Mellon, where he is chairman of the Corporate Governance Nominating and Social Responsibility Committee. He served on the board of the Motorola Solutions Incorporated from 1993 to 2019, retiring as their lead director. He also served on the board of Abbott Laboratories from 2007 to 2020, and he serves on the boards of Northwestern Medical Group and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He recently retired from the boards of the Chicago Urban League and World Business Chicago. He's also the chairman of the Chicago Sister Cities International. And our final witness will be Mr. James H. Sills III, President and Chief Executive Officer of MNF Bank on behalf of the Independent Community Bankers of America. Mr. Sills has over 30 years of banking and technology management experience. His background includes executive experience within large-scale banking operations, community banks, and government organizations. He has served as the president and CEO of MNF Bank and MNF Bank Bancorp since 2014. Prior to this position, Mr. Sills was appointed by Delaware Governor Jack Markle as the Cabinet Secretary and Chief Informative Officer of the State of Delaware, Department of Technology and Information in January of 2009. Mr. Sills was responsible for providing strategic direction and management for information technology operations, supporting over 34,000 end users. In 2014, Mr. Sills was selected IT Executive of the Year by Government Technology Magazine. Prior to starting his own company in 2007, Mr. Sills was an executive vice president for BNA America Bank, now Bank of America, and served as the director of corporate technology solutions for the $80 billion U.S. card division. Prior to that, he also served as the president and CEO of the Memphis First Community Bank, now Landmark Community Bank in Memphis, Tennessee. Mr. Sills serves on a number of boards, including the North Carolina State Chamber of Commerce, the Carolina Small Business Development Fund, and the ICBA Minority Banking Council, uh, the MD MDIC Minority Banking Advisory Committee, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. And we have five distinguished uh, witnesses here today, and you will be recognized, I now recognize, uh, Ms. Manta uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Luchtemeyer, and members of the Financial Services Committee. As you've all noted, these are sober times. Our country's reeling from a pandemic, the economy is in distress, and there's growing civil unrest brought on by years of systemic racism and oppression. And yet I am honored to be here today to talk about inclusive lending and how community development financial institutions, CDFIs, can be partners in the critical work facing our nation. The CDFI industry was born out of the civil rights movement and the riots of the 1960s and 70s, and has grown to more than a thousand institutions, managing more than $222 billion in assets. Opportunity Finance Network is a national network of more than 300 CDFIs. We have a deep history and proven experience. Our customers are 85% low income and 58% people of color. CDFIs provide capital plus. It's financing and financial coaching and business counseling. We blend private and public capital to provide responsible and affordable financing in low wealth markets. 
Our most important public sector partner is the Treasury Department's CDFI fund, which provides equity capital in the form of grants to strengthen CDFIs and help us grow. CDFIs are the financial first responders in times of crisis, during recessions, natural and man-made disasters, periods of civil unrest. When banks restrict lendings, CDFIs lean in. For example, after the protests and uprising in Baltimore, following the death of Freddie Gray, when nearly 400 businesses were damaged, CDFIs, like the Latino Economic Development Center, were there. They were providing the microloans to help businesses survive when aid was slow to arrive from the government. In the aftermath of Michael Brown's death, the 2016 Ferguson Commission explicitly highlighted the work of CDFIs. And this led to the creation of the St. Louis CDFI Coalition, a partnership among eight institutions that deploys loans and resources into some of St. Louis's most economically distressed countries. From the very first days of the COVID-19 crisis, CDFIs understood the threat facing our borrowers, immediately reached out with whatever accommodations they could to ease the economic disruption. Principal and interest payment officials, they made emergency loans or other emergency products to help borrowers weather the crisis. And after you enacted the CARES Act, CDFIs were eager to become lenders under the Paycheck Protection Program so that very small and minority owned businesses could get access to this valuable emergency relief. Yet, as you've noted, the early days of PPP were frustrating as the program rules prevented many CDFIs well positioned to reach the hardest hit small businesses in our rural communities and our urban and our native communities from qualifying as PPP lenders. The first round of first come first serve funding was dispersed quickly, primarily by the largest financial institutions to their existing customers. And that meant that too many small and minority owned businesses could not obtain a PPP loan. But thankfully, there was bipartisan recognition that leaving CDFIs and MDIs out of the PPP meant that too many of their customers were left out. And OFN applauds the regulatory changes and set asides that have been put in place in recent weeks for the second round of funding. To date, CDFIs have made more than $7 billion in loans, and that's gone to very small and rural and native and minority businesses. And last week's announcement of a further set aside is so welcome. And we recommend that the administration create a similar set aside for MDI. So now, in the, while PPP is as helpful in emergency and short-term release, vulnerable small businesses need much more as they tackle the difficult work of reopening and recovery. The nation's CDFIs must be strong to support medium and long-term economic recovery in the low wealth communities where we operate. To meet this challenge, CDFIs need a new infusion of equity capital. And Congress must increase support for CDFIs during this critical stage by approving a billion dollars in rapid response grants to the CDFI industry. Now, the House took an important step. We were so pleased to see a billion dollar appropriation to the Department of Treasury's CDFI fund included in the HEROES Act. In closing, I want to share a note that I received from a CDFI in Minneapolis. He shared that our buildings are in a war zone with buildings being burned down on either side of the Midtown Global Market, a looter killed across the street. But this is our community and we will survive and rebuild. So when the cameras leave and the media moves on to other stories, CDFIs will remain. Congress must help these CDFIs to be stronger than ever. Inclusive lending was critical before the pandemic. It's critical today and it will be critical in the days ahead as the nation works to build a more equitable and inclusive economy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mensa. I now recognize Mr. Pugh for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Minks and Ranking Member Luke Meyer and members of the subcommittee. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with you today and thank you for inviting me to discuss the important work of community development financial institutions and minority deposit institutions during the COVID-19 health and economic crisis. As mentioned, my name is Michael Pugh, and I'm the CEO and president for Carver Federal Savings Bank, a CDFI and an MDI based in New York. I also serve on the board for the Community Development Bankers Association and chair the membership committee. The CDBA is the National Trade Association and the voice for banks that are certified as CD CDFIs. First, I want to thank the members of this subcommittee for their support of CDFIs and MDIs 
particularly for approving $1 billion of funding through the CDFI fund in the HEROES Act. And second, I wish to acknowledge the ongoing events associated with George Floyd and countless others, which underscore the outcry of communities insisting on equality. Some of the recent approaches may be controversial, yet the demand for equality in our great nation will inevitably improve our future. Carver Federal Savings Bank is a federally chartered savings bank founded in 1948 to serve African-American communities, which did not have equality because of limited access to mainstream financial services. Despite our 72 year history, there is much more to do. The outcome of our work should be the economic empowerment and dignity of all people, regardless of their racial background. Carver is a CDFI because of our dedication to the economic viability of our community. We provide access to reasonably priced loans and no cost financial education to aspiring minority and women businesses. Also, we have been an influential contributor to the New Markets Tax Credit Program in Greater New York City. I'm especially proud of my colleagues who have served as financial uh, first responders during the COVID-19 crisis. This crisis has hit our communities especially hard. Black and Latino people in New York represent a higher percentage of COVID-19 deaths than the overall population, at least partially due to the overrepresentation in frontline positions in essential industries. Historic exclusion from mainstream finance leaves us economically vulnerable. Black small business owners are approved for business loans at a rate just half that of white businesses. People of color represent about 40% of the population, but only 20% of the nation's business owners with employees. Minorities composed 37% of the labor force in February, but accounted for 58% of the newly unemployed in March. Like all CDFIs, at least 60% of our lending and activities targeted, target low to moderate income communities. Carver has also responded through the PPP program. We have made 147 loans totaling $30 million and preserving 3,147 jobs and assisted businesses as diverse as hardware stores, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce and daycare centers. I have focused my recommendations on three areas, appropriations for the CDFI fund, modifying the PPP and ensuring regulatory flexibility. My strongest recommendation to Congress is to provide at least 1 billion in emergency stimulus to the CDFI fund. Also, the PPP must be more flexible. Last week's 10 billion set aside for CDFIs was exciting, but deployment requires changes. Borrowers have a range of needs Increasing the non-payroll portion of expenses to 40% is insufficient. We ask that you look at that again. Congress should also extend the application period and rehiring deadlines through December 2020 and make forgiveness simpler for small borrowers. I also recommend Congress extend the temporary regulatory provision lowering the community bank leverage ratio. It expires after two quarters, but should last five years we know that this crisis may take longer. Congress should recognize that, uh, that recovery will be slowest in low and moderate income and minority communities and help by making sure that practitioners have the tools they need. In conclusion, I thank Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and the members of the committee for the opportunity to talk about the work of Carver Federal Savings Bank and the hardships faced by the communities we serve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pugh. I now recognize Mr. Scott for five minutes for his testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Chairman Meeks, and Ranking Member Luke DeMeyer, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Today, I would like to talk about some of the problems facing the Black communities in our country and what COVID-19's pandemic has done to amplify the economic and the health disparities in Black communities. The coronavirus is deadlier for the black population, both in a health situation and economic outcome. While our entire nation is suffering immensely from the pandemic, 
The reality is that members of the black community are dying at an exponentially higher rate than other groups. In major cities with black populations between 25 and 30 percent, black people are dying at double that rate. Black owned businesses and nonprofits are at increased rate risk of being forced to close as compared to their white counterparts. Black entrepreneurs are routinely shut out of economic opportunities that allow their white peers to succeed. According to research from the Brookings Institute, white owned businesses start with three times more capital than their black peers, and only 1% of black business owners are able to secure loans in their first year as compared to 7% of white, their white counterparts. Without significant intervention, this trend will continue. We have already seen the entrenchment of such inequities during the opening days of PPP by, pri by prioritizing clients that already had existing credit lines in, in banks. Black businesses and nonprofits find themselves yet again excluded from life-saving relief. PPP2 has been better, but it's still not reaching a majority of the small black and brown businesses. That is why we push so hard for a set-aside. With a $10 billion set-aside for CDFIs and MDIs to serve minority businesses, we can at least get some of the money started into the communities that need it most. Over the past month, ABIC has, con has conducted webinars for small businesses on how to apply for a loan and how to file for forgiveness. Thousands have attended, but very small percentage of that group has been minority-owned businesses. In the Chicago area, Cook County Board President Tony Franklickel heard of our webinars and she provided money for ABIC to hire a person to locate and bring small black and brown businesses to the application process. In one week, this new staff person found over 200 Black-owned businesses and had an average loan value of $37,000. These are businesses that for some reason did not apply or did not know about PPP. ABIC also provided a pro bono accountant to walk these small, business owned, small businesses through the PPP application process, and now they have their money, which came through a local Black bank owned by a CDFI. Through this process, we learned a lot about what's working and what needs improvement. But let me step back for a second to speak of some of the root causes of the economic and health disparities within the Black community prior to COVID. I will speak from my experiences in Chicago. Chicago was at one time arguably the Black capital of business in America. We had businesses like Johnson Publishing, Johnson Products, and Softsheen. But today, violence is a singular dominating narrative for Chicago, and it has been for a few years. I've been traveling to Chicago for almost 50 years and lived there for the past 32. I've seen the black community in Chicago go from its heyday to where it is today. And it's that loss and the violence in the city that motivated me to start Black Chicago Tomorrow in 2016 to regain the prominence in the black community that it once had. My contention is no one thing, including PPP, can fix the problems in our community. Our community suffers from violence problems, policing problems, job and career problems, housing problems, educational issues, health and wealth care problems, and poverty, and most importantly, a lack of hope. But we cannot limit our problem or examining only these problems. We have to do things to fix them. These are very complex issues, and one solution does not fit all. All of these issues must be addressed and dealt with at the same time to bring our communities back. This is a start doing the right thing today for our small businesses. Without that, there is little hope that we can ever start to deal with these other issues that I have addressed. $10 billion set aside to reach more minority businesses is encouraging, and I'm encouraged that the House has unanimously passed a 24-week extension and greater flexibility in the loan forgiveness process. We hope the Senate will concur quickly, but we still have more to do. Here are some of my recommendations. First, open the technical assistance community to community-based nonprofits or 501c3 organizations to navigate the complex world of institutions, business loans, and document preparation. Second, allow small businesses of color to apply for a second round of PPP and simplify the forgiveness process. And third, a long-term recovery plan to develop a coherent policy and program programmatic agenda for businesses of color. In addition, one-to-one -one financing, coaching, regular training, and webinars access to capital and help with strategies to survive the pandemic. If we implement the current program as intended and get the money to the small minority businesses that really need it, we do have a chance to save many of them. But as I've said throughout this presentation, much more needs to be done. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We're now here for Mr. Sills. You will now uh, give your testimony for five minutes. Good afternoon, 
Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Lukermeyer, and members of the subcommittee. I am James Sill, CEO and President of MNF Bank, located in Durham, North Carolina, which is both a minority depository institution and a community development financial institution. I testify today on behalf of the Independent Community Bankers of America, where I serve as the Vice Chairman of the Minority Bank Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in today's hearing. We must ensure that the pandemic does not set back the critical policy goal of promoting credit and prosperity in America's minority communities. The social unrest and protests that we are witnessing today, not only in our cities, but in sur suburbs and smaller towns as well, only raise the stakes for achieving this goal. Today's hearing is well-timed. MNF Bank is a $265 million state charter bank with over 70 employees. We are headquartered in Durham, and we serve the five largest mark, urban markets in North Carolina. Let me tell you a little bit, give you some background on MNF Bank. Uh, MNF Bank was founded in 1907 by a group of nine businessmen in Durham to serve African Americans who had few opportunities to obtain credit or other banking services. Our rich history continues to inform our values and our mission today. To promote personal and community development to a diverse customer base and continue to be the financial literacy leader, helping customers make the right financial decisions. I would like to focus my remarks on the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP and refer you to my written statement for discussion of additional recommendations for strengthening MDIs and CDFIs to promote inclusive lending. The PPP has played a critical role in helping small businesses maintain their employment, survive, and prepare for the reopening of the economy. We were an active SBA lender prior, before the PPP, and the program fit our customer profile perfectly. Small businesses, the self-employed, as well as nonprofits and churches. As an MDI and as a CDFI, we enjoy strong connections to our communities, solid relationships, and a feedback loop where we're already in place before the launch of the PPP. When there was a doubt or a question, our borrowers simply picked up the phone to resolve it. Overall, the PPP is definitely working as intended. We estimate that MNF's PPP loans have supported the retention of some 1,200 employees. I'm confident that other MDIs and community banks generally have had similar results. To date, we have closed 130 loans totaling $12.6 million. In phase one, our average loan size was 155,000. And in phase two, it was 57,000. The PPP has had a significant positive impact and we are undoubtedly in a better place economically because of the program. Thousands of community banks worked around the clock to process a flood of applications in a very short time frame. I met with the administrator Aranza last week in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was impressed with her commitment to making the program work. ICBA is supportive of provisions in the Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act, H.R. 7010, which passed the House last Friday. The bill provides more flexible parameters for spending PPP funds and a more realistic time frame of 24 weeks in which they must be spent. These changes will help businesses remain open and avoid layoffs. While these two provisions are critical, ICBA supports additional changes to a forgiveness process, which is far too complex. It is my fear that we will be working with borrowers on the forgiveness application for the remainder of 2020. This will be a distraction from the critical and fundamental task of lending money to help rebuild local economies, working with troubled borrowers, and reopening our branches in a safe uh, manner for the public. 
Finally, I would just like to note that the $30 billion carve out of phase two for MDIs and community banks made a real difference in terms of channeling funds to minority firms. Again, I refer you to my written statement for a broader discussion on the theme of inclusive lending. Thank you again for convening today's hearing and for the opportunity to offer my perspective. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Sills. I now will recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of asking our witnesses questions. My first question goes to you, Mr. Pugh. You know, your bank is one of the last remaining black MDIs in the city of New York. In fact, there's very few and they're closing all around this country. Uh, you've been active there and there's a number of members uh, from New York that happens to be on this committee. After the PP, the PP program, uh, was offered. My office was swamped by calls from local minority small businesses complaining about being summarily rejected from applying by big banks and having their local community bank unable to even assess the SBA platform. Uh, can you please speak to these challenges and how our efforts to carve out funds for MDIs and CDFIs changed your capacity to serve local minority small businesses if it did? Uh, sure, happy to. So I think that there were several operational issues that were associated with uh, being able to get the program up and running. First and foremost, we saw that some of the most largest financial institutions were able to take care, special care of their larger businesses that were uh, existing banking relationships. This prevented a bottle, th this created a bottleneck and ultimately prevented uh, the true small businesses from having the opportunity to be able to participate in the first tranche of the program. When you look at the SBA's definition of small businesses, it is much larger in scale relative to the small businesses that truly CDFIs are focused on every day. So you think about some of the major communities that we focus on, like Carver Federal Savings Bank, Small businesses with less than 75 employees are crucial to the overall economic empowerment and systemic growth of the communities. Yet those businesses were not able to necessarily participate in that first tranche uh, because of the, the bottleneck and the volume again that was pushed through the program from the larger financial institutions that had bandwidth and capability to get the big loans into the first tranche. Other thing I would offer is that for nonprofit organizations in our communities, they remain very important. They play a key role in terms of helping uh, communities thrive. And the SBA did not have a system that was set up and designed to process and accept loans for nonprofit organizations under the PPP. That required some adjustment and finagling to be able to get them into the system. Truly, we saw much better results in the second tranche as a result of uh, the work from Congress and the efforts that, uh, that were made to be able to uh, get the program operationalized at a, at a different level. But I would offer to you that those challenges presented were at least just two of them, and there were, uh, frankly, uh, many more. Let me, let me thank you. I, I have a question I want to ask you, uh, as well as Mr. Scott. You know, I'm working on legislation to have the CDFI fund offer direct support, including equity, to CDFIs and MDIs and impacted uh, banks and impact banks, which, you know, I define in my bill, in my uh, MDI bill, uh, as small community banks that predominantly serve poor, rural, and urban Americans. Uh, any thoughts? Can you weigh in on that, on the uh, direct support, including equity? Mr. Uh, let me start with Mr. Uh, Scott and then Mr. Pugh, you weigh in also. Sure, Chairman. Uh, equity is critical for the small minority businesses in this country. For the most part, black businesses and brown businesses don't have friends and family funding to start out with, and they can't get the angel investments. And my experience in Chicago has been trying to find equity for some small business startups, and it's almost impossible because people aren't ready to invest. If the government is able to put together programs such that there is equity available through CDFIs or MDIs, it would be terrific. Uh, there'd be a lot more work involved to be able to get the money to the right businesses, but certainly it's a start to be able to move businesses and entrepreneurs in the right direction. Let me ask you, Mr. Scott, I know I said Mr. Pugh, but I saw him running out of time. 
But what about, I also believe that corporate America has a critical role to play in recruiting, promoting, investing, and training for the jobs of tomorrow and ensuring representation at the C-suites and board. Uh, can you weigh in on that? And I know, you know, can you weigh in on that some for us? Can't uh, also, we could find private equity firms and others help give some equity capital to the CDFIs and MDIs? Absolutely. My contention is that corporate America has to lean into this program. It's been interesting today on the news and yesterday, all the CEOs are coming forward with ideas and programs for what it is they're going to do. This problem didn't start yesterday or last week or last year. The problem's been existing in the black and brown communities for years. And it's time that corporate Chicago, corporate America steps up to the plate and starts doing something. They can put money in, but more importantly, they can lean into problems that I addressed in my prepared remarks and start dealing with committees to work on these issues. Healthcare is an example. Uh, the South and West side of Chicago, black folks die at 10 to 15 years earlier than their white counterparts downtown Chicago. Chicago has the largest, or one of the largest educational systems, universities, pharmaceutical companies, and hospital systems in the country. Seems to me that if those groups came together to work on and address problems in our community, some of the issues we've seen in COVID-19 and some of the issues we've seen prior to that would not exist. So to me, a major role here is in corporate America stepping up, and not just because of a murder that took place last week. They should have done it a long time ago. Thank you, Mr. Scott. My time has expired. <clears throat> I now will yield five minutes to the ranking member uh, of this committee, uh, Mr. Luca Meyer, the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all of our witnesses for being here today. It's a great panel and uh, appreciate your comments. They're very succinct on a number of issues. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, and specifically, I guess, with Mr. Pugh and Mr. Sill, since they are currently bankers. Um, with regards to forbearance, because I don't believe we're going to get out of this economic mess unless the regulators give the bankers forbearance so the bankers can give forbearance to their customers that can, can, can retain the businesses, that can retain jobs and keep the local economies going. So I think it's a change situation here that if we don't do this, we're going to wind up with a situation that we had in the late 9 The regulators actually went in and just got rid of wholesale lines of businesses and entire communities uh, collapsed, banks collapsed as a result of this. So uh, <clears throat> I guess, Mr. Pugh and Mr. Sills, my question to you is, have you had any action, interaction, I guess, with regulators at this point with regards to this issue of forbearance? And if you have, uh, what did they do? And if you haven't, are you giving any forbearance or flexibility to your customers with regards to how they're doing with their loans. In other words, deferring payments, altering loan terms, uh, changing interest rates or whatever. So uh, let me start with Mr. Pugh, please. Uh, thank you. So as you know, there, there are forbearance guidelines that exist today under the CARES Act that will uh, uh, support residential uh, mortgages, borrowers, and of course on uh, the commercial uh, side to uh, have this available. Uh, we think it is important. We have seen a sizable number of uh, homeowners and small businesses uh, that have commercial real estate loans with us request those forbearances. However, what I would ask Congress to also think about is to, uh, to uh, recommend, I would recommend that there would be a, a rent abatement program made available for commercial real estate owners and uh, multifamily landlords. This rent abatement would allow uh, a direct pass through to the tenant uh, so that they would have an incredible opportunity to jumpstart their businesses or recover on the other side of this uh, pandemic. And so again, if this were made available, and assuming that the landlords could show proof at the end of the year, perhaps they would be able to benefit from a tax credit and we would be able to see the benefit of small businesses retool and restart their businesses in a, a viable way and uh, homeowners again, be in a, a critical way to rebuild on the other side of this pandemic. Very good, thank you. Mr. Sills. Yes, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, our bank has been working with our customer base uh, we've offered our customers a 90-day uh, uh, deferment. And if they want to come back to us at the end of 90 days, we can extend it for six months. Uh, the regulator community has been checking in with our institution just to find out how we're handling 
uh, those deferments, what's the percentage of our portfolio. Um, we still don't know the, 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 the total extent of this actual pandemic. So we wanna make sure that we're working with our customers and we're informing our regulators that this may go beyond six months. And so, you know, there's some uh, language that they've actually utilized to kind of guide us for a six month period that this particular loan will not become a TDR. And so if this pandemic goes longer than six or seven months, we feel we should have some flexibility to work with those customers. Well, that's my concern, uh, Mr. Sills. You hit on my, my, my real concern here is that uh, this situation doesn't go away in three or four months or six months, maybe even by the end of the year, whenever the, 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 the CARES Act uh, forbearance provision goes away. Uh, so what happens then? Um, you know, our experience, experience with the bankers over the and, and credit union people through this pandemic is that they're very reluctant to become engaged because of the past uh, overregulation, if you will, uh, of them by the uh, and heavy-handedness by the regulators. So I think we need to have something in place that allows uh, you to be able to get the kind of forbearance that you need, but they've got to give forbearance to you. Uh, just one quick comment, both uh, of you talked about uh, PPP forgiveness. Um, uh, Mr. Sills, what, uh, the, 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 I, I signed a letter this last week to ask the treasurer to uh, forgive or to minimize and, and have sort of a, a mini uh, forgiveness program for everybody under $350,000 loan size, which would, do, you know, would help 93% of the, uh, or 95% of the, 93% of the loans. So, would you, would you think that'd be something that would solve some problems? Yes, yes, I do. Um, you know, the ICBA has put out a position statement related to presumption of compliance between below a certain loan amount. And, you know, given that 80% of the, the loans are below $100,000, and given the complexity of the forgiveness application, which is, uh, I believe it's 11 pages, um, I think there should be some accommodation for some of the smaller loan amounts to just be forgiven if the borrower certified that they use the funds in accordance with what they stated they were going to use the funds for. I do like the idea of reducing the percentage of um, that was supposed to go towards the, uh, the payroll from 75% down to 60 or even 50%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the distinguished chairwoman of the full financial services committee, the general lady from California, the honorable Maxine Waters. If the chairwoman is not there, I will now move to the gentle lady. Oh, yes, I chair. am here. Very good. I'm, I was muted. Am I unmuted now? We hear you now. Thank you so very much. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today. It is so very important, particularly uh, at a time when we have tried to organize a response uh, to uh, the pandemic and to COVID-19. We've learned an awful lot as we have wrestled uh, with some of the problems of PPP and CDFIs. And of course, I'm very pleased uh, that we were able to <clears throat> target some $60 billion uh, when we came back with the supplemental uh, appropriations uh, to deal with the problems that we encountered with the PPP. But uh, in addition to that, we learned an awful lot, particularly <clears throat> working with some of the non-bank CDFIs. For example, there was a requirement that in order to get money from the CDFI fund uh, to make loans, that you had to have dealt with at least $50 million in loan business. Well, we got that reduced to $10 million. And I think uh, one of the lessons that I've learned uh, in working on these issues is that many of those who have been individuals in government who have been dealing with uh, loan amounts, et cetera, in various ways, they really don't have the same definition of small businesses that we think about. And the communities that many of those who are there today are serving, 
we're talking about people who could, you know, absolutely benefit from, you know, uh, you know, fifty thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. And so, when I see some of the definitions and requirements uh, for participation, uh, like we saw with the fifty million dollar requirement uh, with the CDFIs, I think we're going to have to do a lot of educating of folks about what uh, what the communities need uh, that. Uh, have not had access to the kind of capital that would lead them not to need small loans in businesses. So, and that's true with the Main Street program also that we're looking at. But I want to ask our uh, MDIs here today. Um, I have learned that some, there may be some concerns that if you don't dot all of the I's, cross all of the T's, and be perfect, that you will not get uh, your payment from. Uh, the Small Business Administration. Do we need something called substantial compliance in order not to hold up uh, the reimbursement uh, that you, uh, for the funds that you have spent? And let me just start with Mr. Seals on that. Uh, would you please respond to that? Have you seen any problems with that? Or do you anticipate any problems with that? Chair, Chairwoman Waters, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I strongly believe that banks like ours need some type of liability protection because we're having to guide those borrowers through the process, rely on their borrower attestations that they've used their PPP loans correctly. And it puts us in an uncomfortable situation, but you know, we're here to help uh, our borrowers and our small and medium sized businesses. But if there was that ability to protect us, yes, we would, you know, continue to do more uh, lending in, in the communities that we currently serve. Well, thank you. I'm going to take a look at that working with Mr. Meeks. Mr. Meeks and I, of course, have been focused on um, the problems uh, that many of our MDIs face, a lack of capital and uh, the ability to lend in our communities uh, where these loans are so desperately needed. We have learned that there are some of the bigger banks who are talking about deposits in MDIs. And we've also learned that some of the bigger banks are, we're being told are talking about giving back the fees uh, that they have earned in the PPP program to MDIs. Have any of you heard about that? Uh, and let me direct this to Mr. Pugh uh, at the Carver Federal Savings Bank. Have you been involved in any discussions with any of the larger banks about uh, uh, helping with the capital problem that you may have? Uh, uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, we have not been involved in those discussions, nor have we heard about uh, this opportunity, but I would suggest that, I would certainly say that it would be uh, a welcomed opportunity for us to, to discuss it. As you so rightly pointed out, these loans are being provided to communities that uh, frankly need them. And for our MDIs, CDFIs, we do not have the capital and bandwidth to withstand risk if they are not going to be guaranteed by the SBA. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank you all for helping us to understand how we can be more uh, supportive uh, with PPP and other kinds of programs. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. I think the chairman's muted, but uh, I, I will uh... I will take it from here, uh, according to the order we have. Uh, no I want to thank the, the panelists for being uh, being available for the Zoom, and uh, want to thank the staff, the committee staff uh, on both sides of the aisle for uh, making this technology work as best we can. However, uh, members are also left to their own devices on using their mute button, which is which is always a challenge, uh, no matter how many times we do this um, for all of us. Um, and so uh, I, I want to turn to you, Mr. Sills. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I want to ask you about technology uh, because uh, there is uh, some opportunity for us to have regulatory changes so you can better use technology as an institution uh, as a way for financial inclusion uh, or to achieve financial inclusion. Um, the example I'd give is a, a Pew report from last year uh, it says uh, approximately 81% of Americans own a smartphone. Uh, that's up from 35% of Americans a, a decade ago. 
So, Mr. Sills, uh, can you describe the ways in which your bank, your institution, is adapting to increased technology and smartphone use by customers and what effect that's having, if, it, if it's been beneficial or uh, an additional way for you to reach out in new communities? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, today, banks are actually technology firms. Um, you know, we have, we have invested quite a bit over the last three or four years in our mobile uh, platform, but also our online banking platform. You know, the majority of the large banks have uh, a high percentage of their transaction activity actually go through mobile online banking and ATMs, and it's actually in the 50 to 75% range. Most CDFIs and MDIs, our percentage is, is not that high. We do not have the capital to invest in technology like some of the larger institutions in the United States. Um, it's all moving to a digital format and a digital platform, and customers today are are accustomed to actually interacting with banks from a digital experience standpoint. And so I think it's critical that CDFIs receive some investment or some uh, technical grants that would allow them to upgrade their technology to be more mainstream to provide a better customer experience. Do you think that technology can lead, lead us to uh, uh, driving uh, financial inclusion. Do you think it's an opportunity uh, for us to reach the underbanked um, and the unbanked uh, consumers, and, and especially the small business owners that that um, that that are uh, not so well connected that they instantly have a banking relationship from a family member or you know. Uh, uh, some, 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 uh, somebody in the larger social network. Uh, is there, is there a way for us to do this? And does yeah, it have an you know, opportunity? Today, uh, almost ninety percent of all of the citizens in the United States have a smartphone. Uh, about five years ago, that statistic was around sixty-six percent. So today, it's it's just normal to access your, your, uh, your data, your account information, to transact business, to even apply for a loan through your smartphone or through your, you know, your tablet. So I do think that will level the playing field. But again, most of the MDIs and CDFIs, they do not have that technology. Most of the larger- Partnership banks. model, uh, sorry to interrupt, but is the partnership model one that you're utilizing? Uh, no, you know, we utilize a, a, a large um, core processor, and so we're kind of at their mercy in terms of the types of technology that they deploy for uh, institutions like ours. Well, that's um, but sure, we would love to partner with other fintech companies and other companies, whereas we could provide, you know, you know really robust, you know, uh, uh, technology that really is simple to use and just gives a really good digital experience to that end customer. So along those lines, let, let me ask you about regulation. Uh, what can we do to help an institution like yours? What regulatory um, limitations or burdens uh, that uh, would would you think would benefit your ability to help uh, help your customers and help the communities that you serve here in North Carolina? You know, there are so many regulations that we're actually um, subject to. Um, you know, the, the biggest one for us is we're a small institution with 70 employees and just the regulatory burden of compliance and BSA and HMDA, it, it just, um, it strangles us almost in terms of when there's a new regulation such as um, beneficial ownership, uh, it, it just hampers our ability to serve the customer because we're having to invest in technology, we're having to train our staff, we're trying, we have to, um, you know, educate the customers, and it just takes us away from our core mission of providing capital to 
small and medium sized businesses and to the communities that we actually serve. Thank, thank you, you. gentlemen. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Let me apologize for being on mute. I will, however, say uh, that I won't let that happen again. The House committee rules do not allow for members to recognize themselves. And I know that this is a big process. So I've got to stay on the ball also uh, and make sure that I'm unmuted. Uh, so I now recognize the chairwoman from the Small Business Committee, uh, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Waters and um, the ranking members um, for this important hearing. Uh, Mr. Pugh, unfortunately, uh, MDIs were not included in the set aside created last week by the administration. However, as chair of the Small Business Committee, I remain committed to pushing the administration to create opportunities for MDIs as well. So it is also important to note that Democrats included a set aside for MDIs in the HEROES Act as well. What will this mean for PPP borrowers, particularly in New York City? Well, uh, th th thank you. Uh, uh, th th this is an important question because frankly, what it will mean is the opportunity for uh, MDIs, and by broader extension, I also want to call out the importance of CDFIs as a whole. It will mean the opportunity for them to actively be involved in helping small businesses and communities rebuild on the other side of this pandemic. I think we can all agree that for many, they didn't recover from the Great Recession, and to now relive uh, a very similar situation as noted, over 40 million jobs, or approximately 40 million jobs in terms of lost here. So CDFIs and MDIs will play a very critical role in the rebuilding, and having this allocation will allow us to help through a number of uh, very important ways, which includes small business loans, includes financial education programs, strategic partnerships with nonprofits, uh, nonprofit organizations, and and uh, uh, various other offices that will Thank be you. involved in this. Thank you, Mr. Pew. Um, Ms. Mensa, Mr. Pew, again, I have also been vocal in my criticism of the administration for its failure to provide transparency and information regarding the recipients of PPP loans. I believe that without this critical information, it is difficult to determine how much is going to underserve borrowers and communities of color. This was an issue that was recently highlighted by the inspector, inspector general as well. If this concerns either of you, Ms. Mensah, yes. let's start. Yes. yes, Chairman Velasquez, thank you for your concern. We wholeheartedly endorse your pressure to continue to get data from this powerful program. It's been huge, it's huge in our communities, and to miss a moment to understand where these funds have flowed would be a terrible thing. We also applaud your interest in the CDFI fund itself, and we would urge you to continue to seek data on the recipients and on the, on the leadership of those institutions. So we, Thank you. We, we seek that both. Mr. Pugh? Uh, thank you. I will only just echo the comments that have been offered and uh, say that the uh, impact data will be important because it will make the direct connection between the work that CDFIs need to do uh, in order to help restore our communities. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scott or um, Ms. Mensa or Mr. Pugh, yesterday they, um, in the uh, Senate, H.R. 7010, uh, the PPP Flexibility Act, was hotline for unanimous consent, but several holds were put on it by Republican members. Uh, have you, have any of you have heard any policy issue related uh, to the PPP by the Republican senators? This is a legislation that passed the House with 417 votes. I have not, and we urge it speedy, speedy 
passage. We need to fix this program as you and as you already have done so that it can be used, especially the extensions that have been talked. I've heard of no policy issue. Thank you. I have not heard, but I agree completely with what Lisa just said. Thank you. Okay, I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back her time. Uh, I now recognize, recognize gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, for five minutes. Mr. Posey, you may want to unmute. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Posey's got a little difficulty getting on video with on this with a video connection today. I think he is on with his phone, and I think they're trying to work out something where he may uh, be able to uh, ask questions later on. So if you manage to, if he doesn't pop up here in the next couple of seconds, if you wouldn't mind, put him at the end of the queue. Uh, we're going to try and get him to where he can get involved. Very good. And I would now recognize Mr. Tipton from Colorado for five minutes, and we will put Mr. Posey back to the end of the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to listen to our panel today. Uh, this is a challenging time for all of us and all of our communities, and especially rural counties like I represent throughout our district. In Durango, Colorado, in my district, first Southwest CDFI has done an outstanding job to be able to respond to the needs of the community. Through the Paycheck Protection Program, First Southwest has secured nearly $55 million in funding, which has gone directly to 747 small businesses across 83 Colorado towns and retained an estimated 6,666 jobs. In addition to rising to meet the challenges of the pandemic through the PPP, First Southwest has gone above and beyond through its $8 million community fund initiative. Through its community fund, First Southwest Associated 501C3, First Southwest has prioritized COVID-19 pandemic responses for small businesses. The community fund has stood up a microloan grant program targeted toward rural businesses, an emergency loan program, and a rapid response and recovery fund to be able to help with recovery costs, where 60% of the applicants did not receive or apply for PPP loans. On top of all this, First Southwest has also offered 1,656 hours of free financial counseling to 1,141 individuals in the first five months of 2020 alone. Clearly then, CDFIs uh, do have a unique ability to be able to serve communities where they're centralized and an important role to be able to play in the response to crisis. With one dedicated CDFI in my district can have such an impact on its community with its motivation to be able to help others. So too can other CDFIs have an uplifting effect across the country. And I'd encourage all of our colleagues to work together on both sides of the aisle to be able to continue support funding CDFIs during the appropriations process. And additionally, if CDFIs can have such an impact on the communities they serve, we should also think about expanding their reach. That starts with exam examining the on-ramp process of the CDI uh, designations. Uh, Mr. Sells, how hard is it to become certified as a CDFI by the CDFI fund? Thank you for that question. It's actually a very difficult process. Uh, we've actually been a CDFI since uh, 2002. Initially, the process started out, you had to uh, recertify every three years. Today, we have to uh, recertify on an annual basis. We have to submit a, um, a lot of information to actually recertify. Um, our bank has been in existence for 113 years. We are an MDI and a CDFI, and we've been serving our community um, uh, tremendously. We've uh, received an outstanding CRA rating for the past 24 years. And so I think there should be some flexibility for institutions like ours to go back to certify, recertifying us on a um, every three year basis since we are an MDI CDFI and we've had, we have the data and the proof to show that we are actually um, serving our communities. But to answer your question specifically, yes, it is very, very difficult. 
it's an onerous process to become a CDFI. In addition to some of the flexibility that you just mentioned, do you have some other thoughts in terms of uh, being able to make the certification process less burdensome? You know, one idea is to provide some technical assistance that would allow um, the applicant to maybe leverage a third party to help them create that information that they have to submit to be come certified. Maybe our a regulator community could assist in that or a third party firm could help um, with that evaluation of that data as that firm is applying. Well, thanks and uh, did appreciate one to follow up on the ranking members comments in regards to mobile access uh, to be able to open up accounts. Uh, last Congress, we passed and had signed into law the mobile act that I'd sponsored to be able to allow people to open up accounts on their mobile devices using their driver's license. Uh, you'd indicated that there aren't resources available to be able to help assist CDFIs in terms of trying to be able to expand that reach. Was that correct? Yes, you know, the, the CDFI fund has some flexibility or they need more flexibility to maybe redirect um, some of their grant opportunities to focus more on technology projects for CDFIs, because that, that would really help level the playing field. I agree with you that mobile is the way to go. And, you know, most citizens in the United States have a smartphone, but we need more funding to, to fund, you know, the infrastructure and the development of those applications if we're going to be relevant going into the future. Thank you, Ms. Seals. And Ms. Chairman, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this historic hearing, and let me welcome all of the witnesses. I'd like to start with Ms. Mensa. Um, we in Congress had to fight to secure a carve-out for smaller banks uh, and CDFIs and MDIs. We achieved some success with the $30 billion uh, carve out in the second round of PPP, but only got the concession from Treasury and SBA to target $10 billion of second round PPP funds at, for CDFI. Can you please discuss uh, why this matters? Thank you, Congressman, for your question, and thank you for your fight. We felt it. We appreciate it. The 30 billion was essential, but even more so is this recent $10 billion set aside for PPP funds. This is essential because it ensures that you're going to use what we call the capillary system of the nation's financial infrastructure. It will flow through some of our smallest institutions, the CDFI funds, in order to reach the smallest institutions, smallest businesses and nonprofits in those rural areas, well beyond the reach of broadband in deep inner cities. So it is essential. We thank you. And also the other fixes that you've been doing to the PPP program to extend it. Both are needed. And we appreciate your uh, sight for this. And as I mentioned in testimony, your acknowledgement of more additional funds in the appropriation for CDFIs. Those are the critical steps. Very good. Um, Mr. Scott, could you please highlight the significance of greater CDFI participation in the PPP and how it could impact small businesses, especially minority-owned businesses. Well, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, we pushed very hard to get the $10 billion specifically to CDFIs. The reason for that is that they are right in the community, they understand the businesses, and they're working with smaller businesses. As I mentioned also, the average loan that we had through these 200 organizations that we found was about 37,000, which is much less than all of the other numbers you've heard today. So we're talking about mom and pop operations that are dealing in this particular issue. And it's critical we do that, but more importantly, or as importantly, we have to provide technical assistance for these organizations, these smaller companies to be able to access even this $10 billion because they have not uh, been able to do that before we provided technical assistance to them, and they've been able to navigate the programs much more effectively. Thank you for that response. And Mr. Pugh and Ms. Mensa, can you please speak to the challenges faced 
in helping smaller businesses and businesses operating in low income areas to prepare their files for submission to the SBA platform for PPP loans. Thank you again, Congressman, for recognizing the role in addition to the money. We call it Capital Plus. It's the support that a business needs. Many of our businesses don't have private attorneys that they can call on and, and, and accounting firms ready to go. And so they are working with our staffs of CDFIs, often in this remote setting, to try to get those forms correct so that the payroll things are appropriate. We've had people working through the night to get uh, businesses, clients they know, nonprofits they know, through the, uh, through the process of PPP. So it is essential, and it's because of what you said. They don't have all of these other relationships in hand. So the CDFIs and MDIs are performing those roles. Wonderful. Mr. Pugh, anything to add? Sure. So for the reasons stated by Ms. Mensa, the CDFIs play a very critical role in terms of helping small businesses because of the capacity issue uh, that they have, frankly. Uh, but I would also add that on the other side of this program, um, once the loan has been granted, we know that the compliance aspect will be uh, very daunting for many of the small businesses. We would also ask Congress to think to think about uh, uh, ensuring that there are no more than two page requirement for many of these small businesses that are applying for small dollar loans versus the current 11 pages that exist today. Uh, again, because they frankly just don't have the bandwidth uh, to be able to navigate through these very complicated uh, documents and then continue to focus on surviving on the other side of the pandemic as well. And just to conclude, the Missouri Bankers Association has just um, has just recommended to Mnuchin and SBA that there be some kind of easy process, easy form, uh, like you said, a one pager or two pager to uh, comply. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank the witnesses for their responses and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Clay. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bud, for five minutes. Mr. Bud, you may want to unmute. I associate myself with uh, Ranking Member McHenry's marks on members and their mute buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the chair. I appreciate the time. and. Um, Mr. Sills, it's good to see you again. Uh, it's good to have somebody from North Carolina on the panel. I look forward to seeing you in person again. You know, uh, last week, along with several of my colleagues, I sent a letter to Secretary Mnuchin and Administrator Carranza asking for the Treasury and SBA to work towards crafting a simplified uh, streamlined forgiveness application for loans that were under $350,000. So what challenges are you and your customers facing as they begin applying for a PPP loan forgiveness? So we've been hearing from some small businesses and, and owners that the application is quite complicated and challenging to fill out. If they do it wrong and they're denied, you know, that could stick them with the loan that they weren't anticipating. So our intentions behind the PPP was to give much needed relief to small businesses and not to further burden them. So what, uh, first of all, what are you seeing and what would be your suggestions for simplifying this process? Again, Mr. Sills. Congressman Bud, it's great to see you again. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, just looking at this from this standpoint, the, 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 the original application was only three pages and the primary number was how much do you spend on payroll on a monthly basis times two and a half times. This new form that came out on May 15th is 11 pages. And it's very complex. And so I feel that the SBA should produce a, simple, a more simplified form, like a 1040 EZ form. And I also feel that they should create an automated forgiveness calculator. Because I know that we're gonna be inundated with questions from our borrowers, because no one wants to, um, retain more of the loan in terms of paying it back over time when they really need 
the majority of the loan to be forgiven given the you know, economic situation that we're in. So I, I anticipate receiving a whole lot more questions uh, as we go through um, the new uh, era of now we're in the, uh, you know, the forgiveness process of this process, so to speak. Very good, and thank you for that. Um, Mr. Sills, you know, in a, in a prior role, uh, in, a, in one of your earlier in your career, you served as the chief information officer for the state of Delaware, even though we're proud to claim you as a North Carolina, North Carolinian now. So uh, I believe you're even a member of the governor's cabinet in Delaware. Uh, you also led extensive efforts in IT consolidation, uh, cloud computing technology, cybersecurity, other areas. You were named IT executive of the year by uh, Government Technology Magazine. I don't yet have that subscription, I apologize. But you know, it's safe to say you've got an impressive record uh, in technology and you're obviously now that you're in banking and have uh, shown a demonstrated track record of success there, um, you, you know the latest in, uh, in technology in the banking world. Ranking member McHenry had some questions and comments and thoughts on that and so has uh, uh, Representative McKin uh, Tipton from Colorado about technology. But we've, we've really seen you know, a technological revolution take place over the last decade with banks and fintechs finding new ways to innovate. Uh, do you worry that a lot of the smaller community banks and NDIs are being left behind in the tech revolution? Um, that the banking sector is experiencing? And, and if so, what are some ways that Congress can help these institutions keep up with innovation? If not, not even just keep up, but get ahead. Again, thank you, Congressman Butt, for your question. Um, small banks like ours, we're falling behind every single day. Some of the larger banks are investing billions of dollars per year into their online platforms, into artificial intelligence, into end-to-end -end systems where you don't even have to interact with a uh, customer service representative. And so yes, I am concerned that our bank eventually will not be able to keep pace with some of the larger institutions. As I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the CDFI fund has some flexibility, I believe, that would allow them to provide grants to institutions like ours where we could improve our technology. We're not gonna be able to compete directly with uh, some of the largest financial inst institutions in the world, but we at least wanna be in the game. And so uh, if there was an opportunity to carve out uh, some additional funding specifically to level the playing field uh, for CDFIs and MDIs to uh, receive some funding to improve their technology, I think that would help everybody and again you know our institution we're very close to the communities we serve so i really love the role we've been playing over the last eight weeks and so if we had additional technology you know we could help better serve our customers with a truly end-to-end -end digital experience similar to what other large institutions did with their ppp loan process Thank you, Mr. Thank Sills. You. Let's continue that conversation over the months ahead. And I uh, thank the chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from the state of Washington, Mr. Heck, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, thank you for holding this hearing. And thank you to all of you who are participating in this incredibly important discussion about inequality during a critical week. I'm grateful to all of you. And frankly, Amidst the great tragedy of the last week, I've found some inspiration in those who have come together to be united to grieve for George Floyd. Uh, on Saturday, I was honored to be able to participate with 56 members of the Pierce County Black Ministerial Alliance uh, for a public prayer vigil. And yesterday, I participated in a similar event with about 1,500 of my neighbors here in Olympia, Washington, all mourning the death of far too many black Americans. But in addition to sharing their grief, they were also united in sharing a belief that we can't accept the status quo, that it is time to change and that it is past time to change and that we will address racial inequality. This brings me to what I think is a second pivotal moment we're experiencing amid all this 
economic devastation, Congress has the power to set a course for our economic future. And we will all pray that that be a better economic future. And as we have provided the funds for us to begin to deal with this, we've had to ask hard questions, uh, difficult questions. Will small businesses emerge from quarantine ready to rebuild or are they gonna be devastated? Will Americans be able to stay in the place they call home throughout the crisis? Or will missed rent and mortgage payments catch up with them? And will efforts to help America recover from this recession make a difference in structural inequality? Or will we maintain the status quo? And the inequality is structural. Until we acknowledge it for such, we cannot make progress. Congress, in our response, put a pretty heavy emphasis on small businesses hit by the pandemic. I think that was the right approach. Uh, but we are remiss if we do not pay special attention as we have here today, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, to neglected minority workers and minority owned small businesses who have been impacted the most by structural inequality. You know, I've been following labor data over a very long period of time. And the truth is it took these workers to whom I referred over a decade, over a decade, to climb to structural barriers and return to unemployment percentages pre-2008 recession. Last in, first out, and we're experiencing that now. So we have struggled mightily to provide help and improved upon our efforts as this has advanced. I thank the chair, uh, Congresswoman Waters, for her leadership in this regard. But in the midst of this discussion today, here's what I'm struck by. There are a hundred ideas on how we can do this better. There are maybe a thousand ideas on how we can do this better and many of them are gonna be incorporated, but we are at risk of getting lost in the avalanche of ideas. So I'm gonna ask each of the three witnesses to, to, to make a very difficult uh, kind of a response to this question. If you had to distill the two most important things that we can and should do that would have the most impact on addressing inequality, Help us focus, please, amongst the hundreds of ideas. What are the two most important, highest impact things that we could do? And I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Mensa, if I may, please. Thank you, Congressman Heck. And I don't have a hard time with this question. I welcome it. The most important thing to do is to ensure that this country has a robust set of CDFIs and MDIs positioned in the next decade to make a serious contribution to the recovery that the country needs. And there is one thing we need, and that is a more serious appropriation at the Treasury's CDFI fund. The HEROES Act emergency appropriation of a billion dollars to an industry that has $222 billion under management is not outsized. In fact, it should be the annual appropriation for this field. That is my one recommendation because it's the thing it will keep us strong for the recovery. We do not have an ability, we will leverage those funds. There will be many more partnerships, but that is the one idea that I urge the Congress to stay focused on. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scott? Uh, I think a couple of things have to be done and I support what uh, Lisa just said, but I think also we have to work on putting together an overall strategy that's gonna address these issues. And it can be a public-private partnership that works on it but we've addressed this verbally for years and we have not really sat down and done the work that has to be done to put it together. I think certainly from the position of uh, the government, we can put money into equity for smaller businesses to get them to grow, but we have to deal with all the issues that I mentioned and they all have to come together to sit, set this problem up because only setting up small businesses will not do it. We have other issues in our communities, they have to be fixed and we have to have a strategy in the overall to get it done. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recommend, recognize the uh, gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the ranking member for convening today's hearing. I also thank the witnesses for appearing as we experiment and, uh, and try to reinvent our process of conducting committee hearings. Uh, Mr. Scott, if I could, with, with you, and I appreciate your opening comments, your opening remarks. 
I'd like to follow through on the line of questioning about technology. Before COVID-19, you may agree or disagree, it, it seemed like uh, you probably saw very few customers under the age of 30 actually come into your branch. The, uh, the younger generation is more reliant on technology. And now with COVID-19, obviously there are a lot of new normals uh, including in the area of, of banking and, and people's banking habits. And of course, their inability to, uh, uh, to travel outside their home and go to, the, go to their banks. Can you talk from your standpoint uh, of an MDI, leading, in, leading MDIs, um, the challenges that MDIs face as it relates to technology and Again, if you could kind of expound, I think a lot of these questions had gone previously to Mr. Sills. Some of the solutions that you see that, that Congress could provide as it relates to availability and accessibility, which are probably two different things. Congressman, I think you're addressing that question to Michael Pugh, not to me. I'm, I'm not a banker, so. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Pugh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, happy to. So I think that there are uh, at least a couple of very critical issues. The challenges that banks, are, MDIs and CDFIs often faced with is the ability to uh, take to scale the technology demands that are needed because of the capital investment that's required. We're also, many of the CDFIs and MDIs are at the mercy of our, uh, the, the core providers. So the top few core providers that uh, ultimately get to determine whether or not the technology can be integ integrated into our core systems. What I would offer for us to perhaps think about is a couple of key things. One is perhaps there's an opportunity for Congress to uh, support incentivizing core providers through a technical assistance protege program. And this program would then allow those core providers to play a critical role in working with MDIs and CDFIs so that we can meet the demands of our small businesses and our customers as we move into this digital age. We think this is important and we know that frankly precedent is established through the US Treasury through their existing mentor, uh, protege mentoring program uh, that's been set up. Uh, and perhaps that model again could be used to be able to help uh, uh, implement th this recommendation. The other thing that frankly we are faced with is the ongoing uh, capital investment uh, that you heard me mention. And so because it is a significant spend, if Congress would look at this as an opportunity, frankly, uh, for MDIs and CDFIs to participate in grant opportunities that would allow uh, it to be used towards uh, improving your overall technology, we think that this would be extremely important. Remembering that the MDIs and CDIs are often serving low to moderate income communities that need the access to mainstream financial services the most, we can play a critical role in that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Pugh. And with my remaining time, Mr. Sills, if I could come to you, and I'm speaking to you from, from Memphis, Tennessee, your, your former home. Uh, could you you answer this as uh, kind of broadly when Mr. McHenry and uh, Tipton asked you, but are there specific initiatives that you think Congress could, could take in terms of the accessibility and the availability in, in my remaining time? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for your question. You know, I actually think it all comes back to capital. Um, you know, capital is critical to build scale. Um, if we had an additional $5 million in capital, that would allow us to make those kinds of investments that you're talking about. It would also allow us to help more of our customers in the markets that we serve. It would allow us to add an, an additional $50 million in assets to our balance sheet. So if there were opportunities uh, for this committee to recommend uh, strategies to, to, to inject capital into CDFIs and MDIs, I just think it would help 
the institutions, but also the end customers that we serve on an everyday basis. Thank, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, for five minutes. Mr. Lawson, you may want to unmute. Mr. Lawson. I don't see the gentleman from Florida. I'll put him back to the queue if he should come back. I now will recognize the gentle lady from Michigan. Ms. Talib for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you so much to, um, I like to call you all the community banks because, uh, you know, when you start saying CDFIs to all my uh, residents, uh, they're not, um, it doesn't actually click, but when I tell them it's people like us that are running a lot of these um, community-based uh, financial institutions, it's very important. Um, as you all know, we're going very, through a very difficult time and some of us are obviously attending events and we're mourning and we're trying to heal. But I think we want to get to structural um, issues, especially those that have been set up against a lot of our black neighbors across the country. And one area um, to all of you I want to talk about is, you know, according to the Urban Institute, since 2001, the black home ownership rate has been the most dramatic drop of any racial or ethnic group in the country, declining 5%. In Wayne County, Michigan, alone in my district, uh, the percentage of Black people who own their own homes dropped in Michigan more than any other state, down to 40% from just over a half in 2000, according to the report. The cohort of uh, African Americans throughout the country that have lost um, uh, most ground relative to other racial, racial, racial and ethnic groups in middle Asian homeowners aged between 45 to 64, the homeowners having lost their homes during 2008 crisis, find themselves unable to move back into home ownership as they approach retirement age. And you all know, and, and we all know this, some of the backbone in really building stability for families and economic stability for families is home ownership. And so, Mr. Scott, your organization has been very vocal about the broad challenges facing um, uh, uh, our you know, Black communities across the country, which puts them at a higher risk, as you know, um, into poverty traps. Um, and so my question to you is, can you please elaborate on this and how the pandemic has led um, bear, you know, laid bare the practical economic challenges for our communities, uh, again, African-American communities throughout the country? Thank you. Uh, I think it's obvious from what we've seen with respect to the health data, the unemployment data, and everything else that we've seen that the pandemic has impacted the African-American community more so than ever before. But prior to it even, the housing situation you talked about was reality. Uh, black folks did not own homes, were moving out of black neighborhoods because the neighborhoods were going down. And it's something that we have to fix. I think municipalities have to, again, and I keep going back to engaging with corporate America, but I think that's responsible for them to do it. When we look at municipal housing authorities, they are not nearly as efficient as some of the private sector organizations that can do it. I've met with them. They said they can do things much cheaper. We can provide homes at a much more effective cost level. And then if we do all the rest of the things that get people into those homes, I think they'll start moving back into their community. But right now, it's an overall situation that's tough to deal with. Yeah, but Mr. Scott, you know, one of the things I hear from a lot of my community-based organization doing housing counseling and everything is that corporate America doesn't see them the same way. They see the black and com uh, community as well as community, other communities of color very differently. They're approaching it very much transactionally. Um, okay, I did a little bit, I'm done. And so, you know, my next question was about the fact that the private sector and what I call the captains of the industry have really critical role to play to address this. And then what more can the private sector be doing? But I, I think it is some systematic issues and cultural issues where we have to force it. I mean, you all know, prior to the Fair Housing Act and the Community um, Reinvestment Act, all of that was because we had to force them to see them as equal human. And, and that's, it's true, we have to force them. The numbers now of home ownership or even just the, the levels of what we see uh, access to home ownership or banking is actually lower now among our black communities across the country than it was um, uh, prior to even passing 
FHA and CRA. And so what can we do to mobilize more equity under undercapitalized communities and minority small businesses? I mean, you know, I think I feel like we almost need to force it to happen versus these little snippets of, uh, you know, um, uh, if you do this as like a little checkbox, but almost inject changing the complete culture of how they approach these communities. I agree. I think it's been a checkbox and I think it's been verbally addressed, but it's never been actually addressed. I think that we're in a situation right now where if we don't get corporate communities to do so, corp the corporate community to do something, it's not going to change. And no company that I know of gets anything done without a vision and a long term strategy. I mean, that's how we got things done when I was working and that's how things get done today. If, in fact, that's not put in place to resolve this issue, it's going to continue to be verbal. It's going to be continue. We'll continue to see dollars thrown at projects. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars thrown at our communities, and they've gotten progressively worse to your data. That's not acceptable in most corporations. And we have to change it. And we have to bring them together to the party to do it. And then there has to be money for the folks to be able to buy those homes. Well, thank you so much. And Chairman, when that little beep goes off, that means uh, time's up. Your time is expired. I had more. I had more. But thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you so much, Mr. Scott. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentle lady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Riggleman, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you for being here today. I'm so excited uh, to talk about this. And I think with uh, CDFIs and MDIs, they continue to play an important role, helping urban, urban economic distressed and rural communities like mine. My district's bigger than New Jersey, 10,000 square miles. So it's really neat, you know, that we've been able to leverage that. And I want to thank you for your testimony, and I want to start with something about data. I'm a little bit different, and, and i just listening to Mr. Scott, and um, I sort of changed my questions here after listening to Mr. Scott, so thank you for doing that. When you're talking about data and corporate America getting uh, sort of involved with this, my question about CDFIs is how much they exchange data, and I went through and looked at all the websites for CDFIs. Is there a way, and you're talking about corporate sort of donations, or, or not donations, but corporate funding and sort of and corporate participation, can CDFIs, I think there's over a thousand, and tell me if I'm wrong, can CDFIs look at a way to maybe have a one-stop shop or a portal with data where you can direct people using zip code or business loan type uh, going forward? Because data is where I like to sit. I've owned companies in the data space. And do you see that CDFIs, would that work even with zip codes and maybe some competition within zip codes? Do you see where there could be a one-stop shop to actually absorb that data where people are going to one place and able to parse where they're at to get those type of loans or to get that type of support, like the ability to call out proactively to say we have these products. Uh, do you think that's something that we could actually do with CDFIs to have a one-stop shop or a portal where it's not piecemeal with the data that we could use to actually make decisions to go forward? I'll step in, Congressman, just as the leader of an association that has, in fact, a CDFI locator on our website right now. Uh, we've been partnering now with uh, Google, and we've had early conversations with Facebook, we know that entrepreneurs are searching now for where to go. So right now we have a, we have a locator, and you can see where is the CDFI. It would pop up and it would show Capital Impact Partners and Virginia Community Capital are making loans right in Virginia. It's, it, all of these things can be improved. And the other combination is, are we talking to individuals seeking loans or are we trying to find other partners? We have partners in government, mayors. Uh, so I think you're on to something. It is very important. It started in a nascent way at, at Opportunity Finance Network. And this is why our CDFI fund and its ability to keep data is so important to us. Yeah, you know, wondering about a federated way to attack these problems is something that while I was listening today, I had these other questions. Because it seems to me that with the CDFIs out there and the different customer base, when you're talking about the income levels that they're at, I don't want to direct legislation at those you know, income levels or where we could help CDFIs in these certain areas based on the requests that they have. So that's why I was going to ask you know, some pretty you know, technical questions about, is there one place where we can see how many loans you know, CDFIs has look, looked at? You know, who's, uh, who's been accepted for those loans? How hard it was for PPP? Like for Mr. Sills, when he was talking about this, you know, I was very engaged, like what made it easier for PPP, right? Were there things already in place that legislation had helped? And I'll ask Mr. Sills, was there legislation already in, in place that helped or processes that helped that we can prove on going forward, maybe for customer outreach? Because I would think that the CDFIs would want to be proactive to go out to their customers and say, we have these specific type of products that are available right now and we can help you 
streamline the process? Were there things that we can improve on, Mr. Sills, that were out there already that helped? Or what can we do technically maybe through, through legislation to help CDFIs? Congressman, that's, that's a great question. You know, lucky, luckily for us, we were already an existing uh, SBA lender. I think the big difference in terms of how we were able to help our customers is that we did a lot of handholding initially as they were submitting the applications. And then once we started processing the applications, we shifted gears and we actually emailed them um, the loan documents and the notes to sign electronically. Now, you know, I'm an old school banker and generally speaking, prior to this pandemic, you know, we, we really did require a wet signature. So to, to, to answer your question, um, we have to be connected to the, to the community and to our borrowers, and we were happy to participate. Uh, but it, it comes down to, you know, we were already entrenched as an SBA lender. Our biggest challenge was liquidity. We initially did not have enough funding to actually fund all the loans, all the loan applications that we received. So that was our biggest challenge uh, with the PPP program. Well, the, the timing was perfect with that. And uh, thank you guys so much for this. And, and I, yield, I yield back. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Sills. Thank you, Mr. Riggleman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the general lady from California, Ms. Porter. You're recognized for five minutes. Hello. I've been in touch with CDFIs and community banks in my district about some of the issues that they're having with regard to unclear or restrictive SBA guidance and loan terms. Um, Tustin Community Bank um, told me that their next hurdle is getting clarity and simplification from the SBA about what it what it's going to take to get forgiveness of these loans. Um, Ms. Menza, do you have concerns about ex how to explain um, the forgiveness requirements to your customers? Do your customers have questions about what they need to do? Can you identify for me opportunities for SBA to improve its guidance? Thank you, Congresswoman Porter. Simplify, simplify, simplify. We should have extremely shorter simplify documents and I stand by the comments of others uh, to simplify the, the forgiveness period and to make that very clear. Thank you for your added pressure. Thank you for the work the committee has already done to pass uh, encouragement for changes with PPP in this second round. My, my next question is about the importance of PPP transparency. And I've introduced a bill called the PPP Transparency Act to require the SBA to publicly report the details of PPP loans. We've all heard the stories about abuse of the program, but what's getting lost is all of the incredible work and the success stories of the PPP. And so um, I wanted to ask you, the, the bill that I have, the PPP Transparency Act, would require the SBA to put on loan every P put online every PPP loan. And what Treasury has said is they're only going to be auditing PPP loans over $2 million, but that means that there's been no audit for 99.5% of these loans. Because many of you are S you know, you're all SBA approved lenders, you're already required under, um, if you make a 7A loan, to put this information online. Can you talk to me about whether or not you support this kind of transparency requirement and what benefit it might have in terms of giving taxpayers confidence about the importance of funding our CDFIs? I can start again. We support your legislation. We think, and I appreciate your ability to lift up the stories that are actually very, very positive. We are a field that is very used to already, as you've said extensive reporting both to the CDFI fund and to uh, SBA. So we support it and I let yeah. others comment. Um, any I other way? The... Go ahead, Mr. I'm Pugh. Sorry. Yes, my apologies. I, I echo the comments about uh, supporting the legislation. I think the key here is for us uh, to be able to understand that if the small businesses truly intended for the program have been able to receive the benefit, I also think that from an impact standpoint, we want to be able to look at this information and determine where the sore spots or gaps exist 
in order for us to continue our journey in terms of helping to restore on the other side of COVID-19. Thank you. And I think one of the things that might be you know, important to recognize is the PPP Transparency Act um, that I'm sponsoring would require the disclosure of the location of the loan, the congressional district, um, the NICIS code, the number of employees, and really importantly, minority ownership status of the business. And so the goal here is to really show the American people that these people people loans are working in our community. Um, and so I think without this kind of transparency, we're going to see a few stories of abuse and these larger loans that will get audited kind of carry the day um, for the narrative. One difference between the PPP Transparency Act that I'm co-sponsoring and my colleague Dean Phillips uh, bill, the Truth Act, um, is that the Truth Act would have required an explanation of the decision-making processes under which such funds were dispersed. And one of the concerns I had is that that would be an undue, burdensome and difficult requirement, both for the lenders and the SBA to comply with. Um, so I wondered if you had any feedback for me um, on my bill, if there are any of the items that I mentioned that would be required to be gathered that would create regulatory hurdles or difficulties for you. I have no particular I would, I would like to answer your question also. Uh, my answer, pro it, probably differs a little from my co-panelist. You know, as a community banker, we have so many compliance and data reporting requirements. We have HMDA, CTR, SARS, CRA, CDFDI reporting, call report reporting, state reporting. And all of this additional reporting is going to require additional staffing and systems to collect the data. Um, I want to just share with you one statistic of the we only process PPP loans for our existing customers. Most of those customers, in terms of an average, they had been in business 18 years, and most of them had banked with us for over 10 years. So we really know our customers. So if someone was to come in and audit our bank and say, where did the money go, who, who received it, I could po provide that information. But to just put, additional data reporting requirements on community banks like ours, it, it is a burden. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and Chairwoman Waters, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, for lending your expertise and your prescriptive insights uh, to today's discussion. We do find ourselves uh, experiencing a gravity of hurt, a disparate impact, uh, historic times, and familiar times. I want to take a moment just to acknowledge an event that has far too much precedent in our nation's history. This week marks the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre also known as the Black Wall Street Massacre. Now, nearly a century ago, mobs of white residents stormed through Tulsa's Greenwood District or Black Wall Street, attacking black residents and businesses and decimating what was, when, what was then the country's wealthiest black community. Homes, businesses, and churches were destroyed and at least 300 lives robbed. And while they tried to Starting, we have a little technical difficulty. Uh, the gentle lady from Massachusetts has frozen. Okay. Are you back? You tell me. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. And okay. let's go back. I, I want to roll the clock back. I watched when the you, time when we couldn't hear you. Thank uh, you, to Give the gentle lady go back to three minutes and 50 seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I'm just providing too much truth telling today, Mr. Chair. Um, but but again, I do think this historic uh, contextualizing is important uh, given the timeliness of today's hearing. So nearly a century ago, mobs of white residents stormed through Tulsa's Greenwood District or the Black Wall Street, 
attacking black residents and businesses and decimating what was then the country's wealthiest black community. Homes, businesses, and churches were destroyed and at least 300 lives robbed. While they tried to rebuild, the denial of basic social and economic rights, including housing, health care, and education, effectively ensured they never would. From a lack of reparation to redlining, government policies guaranteed Greenwood's demise was permanent. Now, there might be some who think that this historical contextualizing and elevating uh, this in this moment is not germane to the work of this committee. But our nation's financial center is named after a structure erected by slaves. Wall Street then served as a site where they were bought and sold. Slave owners turned to property insurance to protect what they saw as an investment. And banks issued loans using slaves as collateral. Today, predatory lenders set up in black communities where predetermined health and economic outcomes ensure a steady stream of customers. There is no separating the history of racism from the history of financial services in this country. So how do we respond to this current crisis? How we respond to it means we cannot deny that history or exacerbate existing disparities. 2008's financial crisis was a Great Depression level event for black Americans, wiping out decades of wealth building, primarily in home ownership. However, 2013 study found that black banks were 10 times less likely to receive bailout funding during the crisis. Nearly half have gone under since 2007. Mr. Pugh, how does the disappearance of black banks further exacerbate the racial wealth gap? So, the, as you have rightly pointed out, the disappearance creates a real cognitive disconnect in our communities in terms of the ability for small business entrepreneurs, women, minority businesses to have a bank, to have access to mainstream solutions. So examples would be, you know, if I think about my my area, Brooklyn has some of the largest, has had some of the largest uh, women entrepreneurs in terms of growth in that particular borough. And by not having access, um, with the exception of Carver, to other options, in many cases, it could have uh, and has undoubtedly created some real limitations. Across our country, we've seen that the, the ongoing um, uh, closing of our banks, and it really gets down to capital and capacity. And so what I think we we frankly must look at for MDIs is the ability to ensure that they have access to capital through various programs. Congress can play a very critical role in that. And then capacity. On the capacity side, uh, again, very much working with fintechs, big banks, small banks, uh, to ensure that there are real programs to build technology to scale that again allows us to be able to ultimately serve uh, people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pugh. Um, one of the Paycheck Protection Program's many missteps was automatically disqualifying those with criminal history or arrest. Um, I just, anyone on the panel that would like to weigh in, was this punitive exclusion something your institutions advocated for? And do you support our calls to Secretary Mnuchin asking for removal of this exclusion? We would absolutely support that call. Thank you. The general lady's time has expired. Thank I you. I now recognize the gentle lady from Virginia, Ms. Wexton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much to the panelists for joining us here today for this really important discussion. Uh, now more than ever, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that CDFIs and MDIs get the support they need. Now, I, like everybody else on this committee, heard from my business owners in my district, my small business owners, during the first round of PPP uh, funding, that it was almost impossible to navigate the process, that they were being shut out, that the big, uh, that the big borrowers and the institutional clients were getting all the loans. And that was especially so in the first couple of weeks when the guidance was really slow to come. Now, with the second round, as was mentioned by the witnesses, the second round was much more effective, thanks in no small part to the to the set asides for smaller lending institutions, CDFIs and MDIs, which this committee and the chairwoman in particular really insisted upon including in there. And I'm glad that we were able to do that and help so many small businesses gain access to the PPP. 
but we still don't know the extent to which this program really helped the minority owned and small businesses that the SBA uh, really needs to help. And the SBA has not made this information public. In fact, the SBA Inspe Inspector General found that the SBA has not been registering PPP loans by their taxpayer identification numbers, which in some cases has resulted in borrowers getting the funds twice and even three times. You know, it could amount to hundreds of millions of dollars. Meanwhile, others are denied entirely. And they're also not collecting the uh, demographic data that's necessary to determine the extent to which underserved rural and minority communities are being helped by the program. So I wrote to the SBA last week re incre requesting increased transparency regarding loan demographics to ensure that Congress is, is using the program to help the businesses it was intended to help, and that the $660 billion that we appropriated to it is not going to help those businesses who really don't need it. Um, but, you know, we may not, we may not find out any kind of transparency with regard to minority businesses or, or demographic data about where the money actually went. Uh, Ms. Mensa, can you talk a little bit about why it matters to disclose racial and gender, gender diversity data uh, for these loans going out anytime, not just for the Paycheck Protection Program, but at any time, what, what difference does it make? Thank you, Congresswoman Wexton, and I, I want to double down on what you said at any time. I thank you for your fight to get greater transparency. It is how we will know who was able to be helped with this emergency funding and to show where the gaps are. But you're holding this hearing and you're focusing on CDFIs because you understand that gaps in the financial system exist and that we are needed to be, what I've said, the capillary system to get money out. Increased transparency is most important, though, as we continue our fight for greater CDFI fund appropriations. And I urge the committee to continue the data requests there and to not lose sight of the minority statistics that are no longer being gathered in the same way since 2017. So I would urge uh, your fight. It matters where you lend and who you lend to. And this is an industry that has crafted a specialty in that. So thank you for your interest. And at least at the, at the, in that respect, we will be assured that it will go to the to the to the people and and businesses that need it most. So absolutely, um, good advice. Um, the uh, the set aside, you know, in the second round of PPP funding, did help get more funds out to businesses who really needed it. But there was quite a delay and quite a lag. Uh, Mr. Pugh, do you have any any insights into how that may have affected some businesses in your district? I know that I had businesses in mine that were hanging on by a thread and and you know weren't able to to wait for the second round of funding to be able to keep their doors open or keep before they had to lay off their employees. Do you have any such stories from your lending? Uh, sure, thank you for asking. So we, we know that uh, many small businesses really didn't get a chance to participate in the first tranche of the PPP program. We've heard that in some communities, very similar, to, uh, like Harlem, as many as 40% of the small businesses on the other side of the pandemic may not be in a, a position to reopen. Those numbers are staggering, and they are, they are indicative of really two issues. One is the bottleneck in terms of the process that uh, uh, was created through the program. While we recognize that there was a lot of effort and work to operationalize this program. But second, many of these small businesses will need continued assistance and support to think about how to service their customers on the other side of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. General. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, the chair of the Oversight Subcommittee of the Financial Services Committee, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm excited about the hearing and want to compliment you on the outstanding job you're doing. Thank the ranking member um, as well and uh, the chairwoman of the full committee for the outstanding job she's doing. I have a couple of pieces of legislation that I'd like to call to the attention of the witnesses who've done an outstanding job. Uh, neglected to say a word about the uh, staff. Uh, thank you for putting this together. It really is uh, something that uh, I believe 
will be of great benefit to us as we move forward. The legislation, the first bill is H.R. 6868, and it creates the Community Capital Investment Program, CCIP, which will provide direct capital investments and interest-free loans to MDIs and CDFIs, as well as smaller banks and credit unions that serve low-income borrowers. And there's a $3 billion earmark in direct capital investments and loans for MDIs. I'd like to know from you, Mr. Pugh, uh, does Carver Bank support uh, this piece of legislation, H.R. 6868, a creation of the Community Capital Investment Program? I think the program, as you've described it, will have a significant impact for institutions like Carver because we are an MDI and a CDFI. And ultimately, again, as you've heard us talk so much about, capital is an important part of what we need in order to continue doing the work that we, we are focused on in the communities that we serve. Thank you very much. Um, I have another bill, H.R. 6476, which would provide liquidity advances to eligible CDFIs and MDIs, as well as rural banks, and the purpose of uh, providing more PPP loans for underserved small businesses, uh, and it would do so quickly. Um, Ms. Uh, Mensa, do you agree that H.R. 6476 would enhance the current PPP initiative and get funds more quickly to those small businesses um, and the employees hardest hit by the pandemic. Congressman Green, we thank you for your ability to focus on the liquidity challenges of our sector. That's exactly where the stress has been. So we support the notion of liquidity. Things tend to take a long time. So we're even more supportive of the idea that you already passed in the HEROES Act of more funds for the CDFI appropriation, but thank you for your putting a finger on the liquidity challenge. Thank you. Uh, with my time left, I'd like to just mention something that I am introducing. It is a piece of legislation that will um, cause to come into being a Department of Reconciliation charged with the responsibility of ending invidious discrimination. This will be a cabinet level department and there will be a Secretary of Reconciliation. Uh, it will be properly funded because it'll get at least 10% of uh, the funding from the Defense Department. And um, this is something that I think will have a long-term impact. It gives us the opportunity to develop a strategy to deal with invidious discrimination and racism over the years. I, I think that a cabinet level position uh, such as this would, uh, would cause the country to be able to continually focus on invidious discrimination as opposed to it becoming an issue for us when something is triggered, usually something associated with policing. Banking will then become something that we can focus on lending because we know of the empirical evidence indicating that there is um, discrimination in lending and banking. So my question to the, the panel would be simply this. Given that we have a Department of Labor uh, that deals with labor issues and we have various other departments, would it be good to have a cabinet level um, uh, department of uh, reconciliation to deal with the long term uh, relief needed as it relates to invidious discrimination and racism? And I'll start with Mr. Pugh. So I, th I think the issue of racism and discrimination is a broad and complicated one that is systemically tied to education, affordable housing, healthy foods, uh, the ability to make sure that you have health, proper health care. If this cabinet position is one that can help to play a critical role in galvanizing key leaders, bringing them to the table, table private and public sector, to continue to solve for these issues and be candid about addressing them, then yes, it'll be that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I thank the staff. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I, that is our final member. I now would yield two minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Lukemeyer, for purposes of a closing statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, again, uh, 
it, uh, Mr. Posey was unable to get on today. Uh, just as a comment here, as a result of his computer problems and because our rules indicate that you have to be at least uh, visible at, at one point on video to be able to participate, he was not able to participate by his phone. But he, he did say that most of the questions he had uh, were asked by, our, by all the members. So um, just to give you a heads up on Mr. Posey's participation, uh, I'd like to thank each one of the uh, panelists for being here today. Uh, certainly appreciate your comments, your suggestions. We'll certainly take those under advisement. I think um, it's been a very productive session. Uh, I know that uh, the biggest thing we have to do is get our economy going, and you all talked about uh, getting small businesses up and running, and I think they're the, they're the backbone of our economy. Uh, we have to get them going. If we get them going, we'll, as an economy, we'll get going. Um, I know you talked a little bit about um, the importance of CD Valley to do that, as well as MDIs. Uh, they're an integral part of getting this whole picture uh, worked out and getting in as, a, as a whole, as a country, getting going again. And I know that uh, there's a number of comments with regards to the PPP and, and the forgiveness portion of it. Um, having worked on it a lot, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I always told the uh, the bankers and the folks who were administering the program, be careful what you wish for when you started talking about the forgiveness part of this, um, because you allow the accountants and attorneys to get involved, you're going to get a whole lot of paperwork at the very end when this is a really, really simple process. All you have to do is take a copy of your note, a copy of the approval of SBA, a copy of your updated uh, expense information, the cover letter says send me a check. That's all it would take. But no, everybody had to have a a forgiveness 11 point 11 page document which now we're trying to compact down to two or three so again i i, I hear what you're saying we're going to try and work on it but uh, sometimes be careful what you wish for with that mr chairman i yield back and thank you again for a job well done on the committee today thank you mr lucamayo you know i wish to thank i now recognize myself for two minutes for purposes of a closing remarks uh i wish to thank our witnesses today for their testimony for the work that they do serving underbanked and vulnerable communities. Let me also thank the chairwoman of this committee for her great work and guidance uh, on our subcommittee, as well as the ranking member for his work. And I want to thank all of the members for their cooperation on this first uh, ever uh, virtual hearing that we've had. Thank you for your cooperation and working together. Let me thank the staff, the Democratic staff and the Republican staff, for working together and making sure that we were as prepared as we possibly could be for this hearing that I think was successful. We are living through some of the most trying times for our country. And all of us came to this hearing with heavy hearts and genuine concern for the communities we live in and for our neighbors and friends. The last few months have been incredibly trying for us as a country for businesses, for families, and for the U.S. government. Historically, we have found ways to pull together as a country and as a people, even as we grapple with the social division and choices that will define the character and the future of our nation. We cannot and must not sugarcoat the depth of the multitude of crises we face. The COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. Over 100 million Americans have already died, and many more are expected to lose their lives before it's over. The civil unrest rest resulting from police brutality and the spat of brutality and killings of black men and women has struck a nerve for the whole country. But despite the images of riots and violence that dominate the news media, I know that the majority of Americans are coming together. We have seen simple but important acts of kindness and bravery from average Americans across this nation to support their fellow man during the pandemic. Whether farmers donating their harvest to the hungry, people sewing masks and 3D printing face shields at home, or people checking in and helping elderly neighbors, Americans have continued to demonstrate their capacity for kindness and compassion during the pandemic. So with that, Without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. 
without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members to submit written questions and materials for the record to the email address provided to your staff. This hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>